Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. At 95, Rose Styron has held quite a few titles, poet, humanitarian, and mother. A new memoir and documentary take a look back at her life, but despite having published three books of her own, her most well-known literary legacy just might be the advice she gave her husband, William Styron, about a story he was writing. You might have heard of it. It's called Sophie's Choice. Rose ended up giving Bill a critical piece of feedback after she read the first draft of Sophie's Choice. Bill originally had the character of Sophie making her unimaginable choice between her children at Auschwitz at the start of the book. I said, you know, you just can't make this the first chapter. There's not a mother in the world who will read chapter two. Can you somehow save it? And so he did. That was my only f influence, I would say, into his writing. Later in the show, Rose Styron on her own early literary life. Who taught you to read? Uh, my older brother and sister, who were eight and ten years older than me. So they taught me to read when I was four, and they were off to college by the time I was in, you know, elementary school. Right, right. So I was by myself at home, but with a lot of books in the bookcases and people to take care of me when my father went to Washington every day and my mother was doing things at Goucher or in town or being a golf champion or whatever she was. Then on to another acclaimed artist of a different type, Ansel Adams, perhaps the most famous American nature photographer. Connor Knighton looks back on his life's work and speaks with his son about Adams' approach to creating the perfect picture. Ansel Adams was a classically trained pianist. He often referred to the photographic negative as the score and the print as the performance. Over his career, he performed his photos in several different ways, constantly tweaking exposures in the darkroom. I would have to say almost all of the ones that uh, are well known, there's a fair amount of manipulation in the darkroom to bring up what he wanted you to see. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. 95-year-old Rose Styron describes her life as lucky, and it's certainly been an incredible ride, full of unique experiences with some of the 20th century's greatest artists, as she told our Mo Rocca. I had a very lucky life all the way along, and I think it was because I lived in the present or looked forward. At 95, Rose Styron has finally decided to look back at her life as a poet, a founding member of Amnesty International, a mother of four, and the wife of the late author William Styron, writer of The Confessions of Nat Turner and Sophie's Choice. When you were younger, did you envision your life? No. Now it's Rose's turn in the spotlight. She's written a memoir and is a subject of a documentary <laughs> by James Lapine. When the 30th person has said to me, you're my role model, and I think, does that mean because I've survived till I was 90 or because I'm still having a good time? Rose Styron uh, is a legend on Martha's Vineyard. The Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and filmmaker met Styron in 2014 on the Massachusetts island of Martha's Vineyard, and the two became fast friends. Rose is a social animal. Yeah. You know, she lives for interaction with people. That is her passion. And as she says, because she loves to learn and loves being engaged in conversation. How did you get the name Rose? I was named for my grandmother who died before I was born. What was she like? Did you ever hear any, t is your mother's mother or your father's mother? nothing about my father's mother. I know nothing. Rose Burgunder was raised in a well-to-do Baltimore family. Meeting bold-faced names just seemed to come with the territory. This is the part in the piece where we sing voiceover. Instead, at 11, she begged to meet Diego Rivera. Yes. <laughs> Not typical. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I don't think so for an 11-year-old. I don't know. The 11-year-old did meet the acclaimed Mexican artist, and the artwork her mother purchased that day hangs in Styron's home. 
I remember my excitement at meeting this artist who I so admired. And as we were leaving, he leaned down and said to me, I hope someday you will be as great an artist as I am. I left and I said to my mother, he's full of himself, isn't he? <laughs> While living in Rome in her 20s, Rose went for a drink with the writer William Styron, who just happened to be joined by another young writer named Truman Capote. Our romance started that night and Truman looked 13 years old with his blonde hair. Mm. And by the end of the evening, he was saying, Bill, you ought to marry that girl. <laughs> when you married Bill, you didn't expect it to last more than a couple of years. I didn't. You know, we were having a wonderful romance. I hadn't thought about the future. I was just having fun. The fun continued when the newlyweds settled in Roxbury, Connecticut. James Baldwin lived in their guest house for a spell. Philip Roth and Arthur Miller were frequent visitors. My life was that of, uh, you know, a country housewife. During the day, Bill wrote while Rose raised the children. But Rose ended up giving Bill a critical piece of feedback after she read the first draft of Sophie's Choice. Bill originally had the character of Sophie making her unimaginable choice between her children at Auschwitz at the start of the book. I said, you know, you just can't make this the first chapter. There's not a mother in the world who will read chapter two. Can you somehow save it? And so he did. That was my only influence, I would say, into his writing. We have an awful lot in common. But I think after all these years, we're still a mystery to each other. Like so many couples, the Styrons were a study in contrasts. The novels were all in his head. The adventure was in his head. It was on paper. He was scared of adventure. But you were not scared of adventure. I couldn't wait. And I <laughs> resented being <laughs> denied it. But marriage and Bill were more important, so I got over it each time. But you and Bill had very different upbringings. Do you think that accounts maybe for... It accounts for what? For maybe him being scared of adventure and you oh, craving yeah. adventure? Yes, because he had to take care of his mother because she had developed cancer. And he was always aware that she might die. And she did when he was 13. So I think that's what set him on his pattern of being afraid of what was coming next. Rose Styron is candid about the challenges they faced in their marriage, including their respective infidelities. It didn't matter if we felt affection for other people. The fact is, the main thing was our marriage, and we weren't going to mess it up by going too far. She's equally forthright about the depression that afflicted her husband. Many of the artifacts of my house had become potential devices for my own destruction. William Styron wrote about it in 1989. The disease returned in 2000, and he died with it in 2006. Not having ever been depressed myself, I realized that I had a huge lapse of understanding, and I flunked often. It doesn't sound like you did. Well, I did. How do you think you flunked? In the last, you know, year, say, when he wanted to apologize to me for all the things he knew he had done wrong. And instead of letting him talk about it and going over it with him, I couldn't do it. It was a big lack. And I kept saying, no, 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 you're wrong. Everything was fine. Don't worry about that. Oh, that was nothing. But it reminded me of the bad times and I couldn't handle it. Was it also, though, because you were never really a backward-looking person? I never thought of that. Maybe. Maybe. Her mind doesn't go to the places that most people's minds go. And it's not that she doesn't want to think about it or won't think about it, but she won't. She doesn't fester. I don't know how else to put it. Well, we have friends 
buried all around here, as you can see. Friends like 60 Minutes correspondent Mike Wallace and humorist Art Buckwald. So I guess I'll be right there sometime. <laughs> not for a while. I hope not. But I like that there are flowers coming up as this was is where I'd be buried. <laughs> Maybe some roses will come up next. What do you think keeps her going? I think a thirst, I think Rose has a thirst for life. I don't have that thirst for life, I'll tell you that. But I wish I did. For Rose Styron, that thirst hasn't yet been quenched. Not a lot of people make new friends in their late 80s and 90s. True. I never thought of that. What do you think that says about you? I think it says that friendship and family are the two most important things to me. Are you still looking for new friends or is your dance card filled? <laughs> My dance card will never be filled. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Mo's chat with Rose Styron. You can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. So I had one adventure after another. As promised, here's more from Mo Rocca and Rose Styron. Your life in Baltimore in Atlantic City as a little girl, it sounds like an adventure. I adored Atlantic City. It was such an adventure and it made me self-confident and sure, I wanted to live by the water, which I wasn't allowed to go into. Uh -huh. uh, but I had all day, every day, except for meal time, by myself on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. And so I had one adventure after another. And it was fun writing the memoir because I remembered all the adventures. Right. You remembered all that in such great detail. In retrospect, was that a great thing that your parents did for you, giving you free reign? It was. It was great. And whether they realized it or not, because they took my older siblings away in the summer uh, traveling, and that's why I went to stay with my grandmother mm -hmm. in Atlantic City. So. Sure, <laughs> I lucked out. Who taught you to read? Uh, my older brother and sister, who were eight and 10 years older than me. So they taught me to read when I was four and they were off to college by the time I was in, you know, elementary school. Right, right. So I was by myself at home, but with a lot of books in the bookcases and people to take care of me when my father went to Washington every day and my mother was doing things at Goucher or in town or being a golf champion or whatever she was. So I didn't see that much of my mother. Yeah. My father and I, you know, would listen to Franklin Delano Roosevelt on Sunday nights together <laughs> at home because I was a little girl. You know, I was born during the Depression. I was a little girl in World War II, and my father and I would be together on weekends, and that was fun. A lot of alone time? Oh, yeah. Lots of alone time. But then I adored school and had lots of school friends. What attracted you to Bill? To Bill? Yeah. <laughs> he was tall, handsome, romantic, brilliant. Very funny. That's a pretty good package. Excellent package. We both loved to sing, so we did a lot of singing together in what, Rome. What, what, what did you sing? Classical stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, all kinds of things. Yeah. Not pop music, but country. Standards. Standards, country, and classical. When you read back over your memoir, I mean, it includes some of the most important writers, playwrights, poets, novelists of the None 20th century. None of us century. were in those days. Right. We were just young yeah. writers or artists yeah. or musicians, whatever we were doing, actors. Sure, but when you, but, but when you do read over, because you had to read over your memoir, right? When you, when you were working yeah, on it. Yeah, they became famous, most of them. <laughs> and what do you think? Do you think, holy smokes, look at all these people I've been with, befriended, married, myself, the whole thing. I just think I was lucky. 
you know, that I had wonderful friends who were creative in many different ways and therefore made my life rich and my children's lives rich and Bill's life rich. Up next, the enduring photos of Ansel Adams. Welcome back. Ansel Adams is often hailed as a master of landscape photography. Connor Knighton takes us inside a San Francisco exhibit celebrating his groundbreaking images alongside contemporary artists inspired by his work. In the spring of 1927, photographer Ansel Adams hiked with his friends through the snow at Yosemite National Park in California. The 25-year-old brought along his camera, as he always did, stopping to take a photo he later titled Monolith, the Face of Half Dome. That now iconic image helped launch his career. Adams went on to become one of the most recognizable faces of American nature photography. Many photographers speak about the fact that you cannot take pictures of the Western landscape today or the national parks without automatically thinking in some way of Ansel Adams. This is where you see those raindrops gathering on the pine needles, the really beautiful kind of mist as it clears. Yeah, Sarah McKay is an assistant curator for the DeYoung Museum in San Francisco. Adams was born in San Francisco. His first solo exhibition was held at the DeYoung in 1932. What Ansel Adams advocated for throughout his career was how photography should be considered a fine art in and of itself. For a while, was it not? Were people not taking him seriously? Yeah, I mean, photography, even into like the 50s, 60s, and 70s, photography was always kind of struggling to be considered a fine art medium. Today, we know it to be, but it, it was not even throughout a lot of the 20th century. Adams was ahead of his time. In the de Young's new exhibition, Ansel Adams in Our Time, his images are displayed alongside the works of some of the contemporary photographers he influenced. Photographers like Abelardo Morel, who uses a camera obscura tent to capture two views simultaneously. This photograph is actually of the ground itself with the image projected onto it. Oh, so uh, this line I'm seeing is This is concrete. the cement concrete, yes. And so what's so funny about this picture is Ansel Adams took Clearing Winter Storm from a parking lot. <laughs> Clearing Winter Storm is typical of Adams' work. Nature is shown as a pristine wilderness. Contemporary photographers, on the other hand, are more likely to include evidence of a human presence, playing up that contrast. Adams is best known for the contrasts he created in the darkroom. When correspondent Ed Bradley visited him at home in Carmel, California for Sunday morning in 1979, Adams gave a glimpse into his painstaking printmaking process. See how this is burned out? So you discard it. that. So I just discard that. What do you do with your rejects? They are destroyed. <laughs> Everybody's asking me, oh, don't throw it away. Even if it isn't good, I'd like it, but I can't let bad prints out. You're, you're a perfectionist now? Well, you have to be, yes. Come on in here, Connor. Oh, so this is the dark room. This is the dark room. Ansel's son, Michael Adams, used to accompany his father on his photographic expeditions. Today, he lives in that same Carmel home, where he's kept the dark room intact. This happens to be a moonrise. Oh, that's moonrise. Yeah, I recognize that even in reverse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a cliche phrase, but to say that, like, this is where the magic happens. For him, it, it was. It did. This was where the magic happened, yeah. Ansel Adams was a classically trained pianist. He often referred to the photographic negative as the score, and the print as the performance. Over his career, he performed his photos in several different ways, constantly tweaking exposures in the darkroom. I would have to say almost all of the ones that uh, are well known, there's a fair amount of manipulation in the darkroom to bring up what he wanted you to see. And he would say, this is not what you're going to see when you look at this, but it's what I want you to see. But as far as what he wanted you to see, Adams was reluctant to get specific. Here's what he told Sunday morning, three years before his death. People say to me, well, what did you mean when you did that picture? What did you have in mind? I said, it's in the picture. No, I mean, I want you to tell me. What were you thinking about? I said, if it didn't in the photograph, then I failed. <laughs> 
with crowds still coming out in droves to see his photographs decades later, and with contemporary artists still riffing on his compositions, it's clear Adam succeeded in capturing something timeless. His ability to spot those images that were going to be majestic and iconic and really just gorgeous is something that I think differentiates him from, from so many. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.